Uh, first of all, welcome. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, this is, for those, the uninitiated, this is um, Concentrate's uh, monthly speaker series. We're trying to do something a little different this month um, and take it outside. Um, and we really lucked out on the weather. I'd like to claim credit for it, but obviously I can't. Um, so uh, it seemed appropriate that by doing um, food carts as our topic that we should probably be at least within proximity of some food pot carts. Um, so uh, thanks to Mark's Carts and Bill's Beer Garden for letting us do this. Um, just so you know, I'm Jeff Myers. I'm the managing editor of Concentrate, also of Metro Mode, which is a sister publication. Um, we try to do a speaker event every month. Can, is this helping? Is this like, okay, good, good. Um, uh, we're underwritten by the Michigan State Housing Development Authority. Uh, they help provide uh, the funding so that we can do these and, you know, provide some refreshments, which, by the way, if you're here for the speaker series and you go up, please tell them, and they will uh, put it on our on our tab. Um, so, food carts, food carts have been popping up all across the nation. Um, I actually moved here from uh, Portland, Oregon, which is kind of ground zero for the American food cart um, trend, although... To be honest, they've existed in other countries for as long as many other countries have existed. Um, but food carts have really gained popularity in cities like San Francisco, Austin, Miami, Houston, Baton Rouge, Philadelphia, Los Angeles. Boston is actually enacting very aggressive promotion of food carts there. Even I found out Tulsa, Oklahoma has an active food cart scene. Um, that was. So that was uh, that was a surprise. Uh, Santa Fe has a new one that they're kind of struggling to figure out how to make it work. Um, I wanted to tell you briefly why the food cart movement is uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, as I mentioned before, I moved here. I lived in Portland, Oregon, and um, I lived in a uh, in a, a neighborhood in Portland that was a small residential neighborhood. Very old homes. As a matter of fact, mine was built in 1863 when I was there. Um, but Portland has very different development ideas about how you structure neighborhoods than Ann Arbor does. So even though I lived on this street with all these little old homes, there were uh, mid-rise buildings on our corners. There were little shops along some of the main thoroughfares. Not a business district per se, but they would be threaded in to the building. So there was a bike collective and a video store and a pub. And cafe and a bookstore all within walking distance of my home and there was this one large parking lot for a long time that had sat vacant and um, the real estate wasn't valuable enough to be developed commercially but wasn't cheap enough to be converted into homes so it just sat there for about 10 years um, about the year I left is when the food cart explosion happened in Portland and now three blocks from my former home is the Mount Tabor food pod which is that vacant parking lot that we always had to walk past that we said isn't anyone ever going to do anything with this thing it's become the food pod in our in that neighborhood there are 15 food carts um, the ground cover is hazelnut shells because Oregon is, I think, the world's largest hazelnut producer, or one of them. And so they started using the hazelnut shells that had no other use for ground cover. Um, it's become incredibly popular with the neighborhood. Um, and uh, it's become uh, popular with people who live there and people outside of here. Uh, Portland currently has more than 500 food carts. In the last three years, that's represented a 250% increase in the number of carts that have developed. The city collects $1.1 million in annual taxes from these businesses, as well as another $300,000 a year in permitting. Um, they have 51% of the food carts are owned by foreign-born citizens. Um, so it has provided a uh, entrepreneurial um, uh, pathway for people who might otherwise struggle to find credit in our banking system, particularly in the current economic situation. Uh, the, there's a, um, a site called Food Cartology. They actually do a lot of formal research on food carts, 
and their impact on neighborhoods. Um, they estimate that the revenues from the carts in Portland range between $25,000 and $75,000 a year. So they're essentially owner businesses. They're not, it's people are buying a job in many ways. Um, the county has assigned 1.5 full-time inspectors solely to food carts in the city to handle uh, health and food handlers licenses, zoning and fire marshal approval, things like that. Um, so uh, it, it, it's fascinating what's been going on there. When I saw that Mark was launching Mark's carts here, I became very excited about the possibility that this trend would add to kind of our cultural and dining opportunities. Um, uh, and unfortunately, it's had yet to kind of extend past here, um, and we can talk about, we'll get to that. Um, so with all of these things in mind, I decided to put together today's speaker event. So I've invited a couple of people to come to speak. Obviously, um, the first and most probably most important person is Mark Hodash, who's actually the mastermind behind Mark Starts. Um, on my left here is Nicole Rupersberg, who is not only a frequent contributor to Concentrate and Metro Mode, but she's a well-known food writer, uh, cultural writer. Um, she's a blogger with Eat at Detroit. She's contributed to Huffington Post and Curb Detroit and more blogs than I can think <laughs> of. And she probably knows more about food than I, I, I can think of anyone else locally. Um, whenever I go into Detroit or Ace Upper, I call Nicole and say, where should I go eat? Um, and then, um, you have to make sure I say your last name, but this is Priya Iyer? Yeah. Okay, Iyer. Um, this is, Priya Iyer actually contacted me after I put together this event, and it was very fortuitous. Um, she has a master's in architecture from Lawrence Tech University, uh, but in 2011 she won the Pellerin Travel Fellowship, which support, supported her investigation into mobile food systems, including food carts, and she had done um, her research on uh, Off the Grid in San Francisco, correct? Which is their food card collected. Um, so I am going to basically take a seat. Mark, if you'll come and join us. And um, and I basically am going to... Uh, oh, yes. Uh, so we have Kristen here who um, is from the health department, correct? And she's going to shut us down. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and... Um, She's here in case there are questions that pop up about food carts, what it takes to get them licensed and legal, and um, and make sure we don't all die from salmonella. Um, so, um, but uh, we're gonna keep this as kind of a question and answer. I have a bunch of questions for them to kind of lead in the discussion. But if you have ones, start percolating them in your brains, and uh, we'll get you into the mix too. The idea is to have a conversation about this. Um, so, you want to join us? Sure. Awesome. All right. I am going to uh, ask to start with you, if that's all right. And um, what I was hoping is if you could um, give us a little perspective on Mark's cards in particular, how you got the idea, and basically how you put the idea into action, and what arrangements you have to do to make something like this work in Ann Arbor. Well, Ann, Ann Arbor is a great. <laughs> A, a great town to. I think you got to bring it right up to your lips. Like that. Is that it? It's working. Louder. Yeah. Try that. Hello. Yeah. There you go. All right. So I was sitting on my back porch, uh, back door to the store, in August of 2009, and I had a vacant patch of dirt back there that I just bought from the city, and I had a vacant building over here, and. Uh, behind the beer shed is a building that had been rented for years, it wasn't anymore. So, it suddenly occurred to me that food carts might be an interesting, an interesting um, way to use the space. Carts there, but I knew carts had to be tethered to a legal kitchen, so we put in a commercial kitchen. And the idea just fell together in a moment. I went to the, first to the planning department of the city, who said, great idea. And then I went to the health department, and they said, great idea. And they helped all the way through. And so from the outset, you better make friends with your planning department and your health department, because <laughs> you won't get around them. They have to be part of it. And uh, then as I thought about it more, I just became intrigued with the entrepreneurial uh, opportunity it creates. It's a 
it costs 200, 300, 400 thousand dollars to open a restaurant these days. It costs 20 thousand dollars to buy a fancy food cart and six thousand dollars to buy a bare bones food cart. So uh, we've got eight food carts out there. Most of them made money this year. The ones that worked the hardest made the most. There were about 35 people employed by the food carts. And it's a fantastic. The benefit to the store, my downtown home and garden, which is really my pride and joy, is that it brings people to the neighborhood. So the foot activity on Washington Street has just gone straight up. And here we are. It's the first cousin is Bill's Beer Garden right here. And so here's 150 people that w wouldn't have been here. Would have been two cars here last month. So entrepreneurial opportunity, working with the city, having the the uh, bare bones and the faith that you find people to rent the carts. That's how we got here. Now, are there um, are there there are things about doing it here that make it work here? Correct. I mean, Michigan's whether it's Ann Arbor, it's Michigan. There are certain ordinances that kind of constrain how this. Can well, the go. city and the county here helped a lot. I don't think they helped that much in all communities. I think sometimes uh, restaurateurs feel threatened. I, I think the uh, casinos in Detroit sometimes feel a taco truck is a threat to their food operation. And uh, we, our neighbors around here, have done just fine. They haven't, they didn't lose business to food carts this summer. It's more people here. On a rainy day, they eat somewhere. So the rising tide lifts all boats. So I, we didn't uh, advertise it. We, we didn't try to make a lot of waves in the newspaper, but we just moved through the city and the, and the county process quietly and got the place built and it was not a problem for our neighbors, but it could be in other other communities. Um, is there a, how about I um, ask Priya to join in this? Priya, you've done, um, uh, you've, re, you've researched mobile food systems and food car culture. Can you provide a little background for, you know, how this is developed in other communities and the impact it's had? Sure. Um, so San Francisco is, is really unique, and specifically the Mission Valley. Um, there are a lot of low-income immigrant Hispanic women who basically don't have jobs, don't have the ability to um, support the infrastructure that's required. So Off the Grip basically came out of trying to make these entrepreneurs successful. Um, they work closely with an organization called La Cocina, which is basically a, a community kitchen. Uh, incubator program, and um, they 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 have different tactics they use in different communities. So they select specific uh, first-time vendors for an event at a certain location versus more experienced uh, vendors at another location in Berkeley. Um, they also don't do these markets every day at the same location. It is a weekly market. Um, so their kind of job is to go in there, activate the space, and then leave so that the restaurants and the, the neighboring businesses can kind of thrive during the week. Um, so they support the businesses in a way. So, so they don't have a, so they don't, unlike say Portland or Austin, they don't have a, a permanent um, food cart presence. It's more of a either, um, you know, temporary or, or regularly occurring but not necessarily every day of the week? Right, there are certain um, carts that are permitted to work with the Parks and Rec Department in San Francisco that show up on a regular basis but they're one or two or three, they're not an aggregation. Um, the aggregation is really an organized event uh, and very specifically targeted to solve a certain problem in the community. Okay, yeah. So, Nicola, that, is that somewhat similar to what's going on in other parts of Southeast Michigan, right? Um, well, speaking specifically of food trucks, food carts. Well, did they, okay, so do they delineate here? Do they, what? Explain Do they delineate more between what a food truck and a food cart is? I mean, does, are the rules different for if it's mobile versus stationary, or are there other... Has anyone tried for any other stationary food cart scene? Um, as of right now, there are. There's nothing else like Mark, like Mark's carts anywhere else in Metro Detroit. Um, 
there has been I, there's been talk of it. There are uh, there's a a growing food truck scene that's happening in Ferndale, Royal Oak, you know, mostly Oakland, you know, Oakland County, and they do weekly to monthly meetups, um, and it's really becoming very popular. But the organizers of this event have tried to have, have been in discussions trying to set up sort of a, a semi permanent location like Mark's Carts, and have been, just been sort of shut down throughout that process. Um, and it's mostly, it has a lot to do with the community and the, the area of businesses really just not being being welcoming to that idea. Um, so that's sort of the issue that they're facing. Uh, again, they're more truck oriented, so it's more mobile oriented, whereas Mark's carts are stationary carts that stay put. So, so what is the, what are the, what are some of the issues that brick and mortar businesses have with the idea of carts, food carts? Ultimately, it comes down to what I like to call the INFs, the it's not fairs, um, and it's just, and it's just it's really and I, I talked to a lot of business owners about this, you know, especially when this really became a heated topic for a short time, um, and it's it's really just a lot of it's not fairs. It's not fairs that they that we're making this investment and they're not. It's not fair that we're paying for these different liabilities and these different licenses and this is different insurance and they're not. Um, so their biggest issue comes with well, I don't care if they pop up maybe once a month for these once a month meetups that are happening. It's called Motor City Street Eats if you're interested. They don't really, they're not bothered by that, but to have a roving truck, you know, five days a week during peak business hours is something they, they really don't welcome it. They're really not happy about it and they don't want them there. Um, and then each community is different as far as just <laughs> zoning and how they treat it and how they license it. Some some are very welcoming, like Ferndale's very welcoming. Uh, they they basically have to be approached about, you know, where they can potentially park, um, different different issues that the city will address. But uh, Ferndale tries to be very welcoming, but again, the community businesses have not been, so. So, uh, not obviously it's gonna be your opinion, but so which of their concerns are valid if, if you have the not fair, what is a valid not fair concern, and what is a we don't we simply don't want competition? I think with this, and this is something I really try to express a lot. There's so many benefits that outweigh the cost. The biggest it's not fair argument is it really comes down to money. We invested two million dollars into this business. We should reap the benefits of all the people that are coming into the city. Well, okay, I get that. You know. $2 million versus a $20,000 truck or even a $200,000 truck if you really want to get fancy is a lot more. So I understand that to a certain extent, but at the same time, you know, the, the key with food carts that's really been proven important in other areas where they're taken off is the amount of street excitement that it, that it invites people coming to these destina uh, destination areas and really activating that block wherever they should be located. And those people stay, they get their taco, they get their burrito, they get their whatever, but they stay, they go to the bars, they have drinks, they check out the shops. So if the argument is, well, we, we should be able to capitalize on all the people who are here, like, okay, well, how, what are you doing to bring them here? Because these food trucks actually bring them here. Um, another big argument that I get is that food trucks are stealing our business. Okay, well, if I were here in Ann Arbor and I was planning on having dinner at the Chop House and then I passed a taco truck, I wouldn't look at the taco truck and be like, problem solved, there's my meal, I'm all set now. It's, it's a totally different kind of dining experience. And to make that argument that they're stealing our business is just, it's, it's the same, it, it would be the same as making that argument against a McDonald's. I don't want this McDonald's to open next to my five-star restaurant because it's stealing my business. Well, it's really not. <laughs> so, but what, so what would be, what are, then what are the valid criticisms that are obviously encouraging some communities not to develop these? Um, I think what all the kind of squawking sort of ends up promoting is that, you know, a lot of city government, they just don't know what to do with these, this business model. They don't know what to do with it, what to make of it. Um, for them, it's, you know, if they allow them to park in a certain parking space, they need to move every few hours and they have to, they have to uh, clear that parking space in advance so that, so that um, you know, they know exactly how much revenue they're potentially losing from the parking revenue. And I mean, there's just, there's so much sort of confusion. It's such a new business model that cities are still trying to wrap their heads around it and they don't know what to do with it. So I think when the business owners really kind of squawk up, it's, it's sort of a nice, reason to not have to address it anymore and, and figure it out. So Mark, did you find that when you were developing it here, 
was there a, we don't know what to do with it, or is it, or did was it that your situation was kind of unique enough that it made it kind of grease the wheels a little? The way I sold it was that unlike food trucks that traditionally go to the business, to the game on Saturday, to shift changes, we 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 were going to have food carts in a, in a location that collectively would represent a very broad menu. And uh, speaking about it in those terms seemed to diffuse things, that we're going to be in one spot and uh, we're going to be very interesting and, and we will become an attraction and we will help the community, help the neighborhood, which we did. And um, I just don't think it hurt restaurants around it. I, I haven't heard it. We have, you have a question? Have a question for Mark. What criteria did you use to choose the carts and the themes of the carts? So what she asked was, what criterion did Mark use to choose what kind of carts he was going to include? The most important thing was that they were run by somebody I could get along with. <laughs> <laughs> because we have to share a kitchen amongst us. Um, Everyone has different standards, and we had to have people that we, I could talk to. So that was that was the fundamental thing. And then I tried to keep the menu somewhat separated, although just because you sell coffee doesn't mean no one else can. And not all tacos are equal, so there's overlap. But uh, we tried to keep them separate. Do you have more demand than you can meet for space? So she asked, does he have more demand than he can meet? I think so. This is just the time of year uh, when we start looking for carts. I don't know if they're all returning. I know at least one is moving on to a brick and mortar restaurant this winter, that one last year and one this year. So I assume we're going to need two or three more carts to fill the space. So I don't know if we have too many or what. But. Actually, I'd be really interested if um, anyone can talk about kind of, is this frequently a stepping stone to, or, or, or not? It seems like Nicole has a reaction right away. It's, it's really not. Um, the, uh, the, the study you were citing, the food cartology, um, a lot of people, and again, this goes back to the brick and mortar businesses kind of squawking and crying and moaning. It, 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 there seems to be the perception that people make money on food carts and food trucks hand over fist. They don't. It's not a high paying gig. I mean, these are people, these are, in, these are independent small business owners that work 60, 70, 80 hours a week on their own. It's all families. I mean, it's, it's the, the absolute quintessential small business. Um, some places have been very lucky, like uh, the, the cart that Mark is referring to is called Eat, um, and they really started out as a catering company. They were able to move, they made enough money catering that they were able to move on to a brick and mortar business earlier this year, and that's why they're no longer part of Mark's carts as they were last year. But it was really the catering revenue that enabled that. Um, a food truck itself, cart, is not going to make enough money just doing that, just serving events, just you know roaming around the streets. If they're allowed to do that, even they're not going to make enough money to go and turn around and make a you know two hundred, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollar investment into a brick and mortar business. But it does give them the opportunity to see if they want to try to find that kind of money to make the investment. The seventy hours might be just too much for them, so it's a great learning experience. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, in San Francisco, actually, I noticed there's a different model. I mean, street food and the off the grid is used more as a showcase of, of the food that uh, these vendors are creating. So a lot of them do have brick and mortar stores and continue to have their street food because they attract more people to their, it's a marketing strategy almost. Um, so they go and showcase their food at different venues and locations and now people want to go to their brick and mortar store. Uh, one of the examples is onigiri, um, uh, which is like a Japanese rice ball. Um, and this guy started off just working in cafes, then started off with a really small cart, not a fancy food, food truck, um, and now has a brick and mortar store in the San Francisco business district, uh, along with continuing to operate this cart on a weekly basis with off the grid. Um, I also want to make another comment about uh, cities kind of responding the way they do. The reason they're more cooperative with Off the Grid is because there's, an, there's Off the Grid that's like the organizing uh, entity that kind of cleans up, brings, you know, goes through all the process of organizing the event, coordinating it, and then making sure that uh, the space is left the way it was cleaned uh, after the event is over. And so, um, so I think it's easier for like the food cart 
uh, vendors to go to off the grid and then off the grid kind of manages all the operations for them. Um, they also have like a requirement of like, okay, if you're going to be part of off the grid, then you need to sell at least $1,400 worth of um, um, food or, you know, you need to earn that much money in that two hour or four hour period. So they do have those requirements and then they have like, a, I think 10 to 12% that they give back to off the grid. Um, you know, it's interesting that you bring up the, um, the idea of cleaning up because Food Cartology out of Portland, um, when they did their study, the number one negative effect that they found with food pods was dealing with trash. Um, that when you had 15 pods, all with 15 different ideas of how you never deal with trash, you don't get and different standards, I assume, like you were saying, getting finding people to get along. And they're finding that this is the one thing they had to start to rewrite their ordinances to accommodate to make sure that trash was dealt with effectively, which I thought was interesting. Um, that was the number one complaint. Um, the number two was infringing on parking. Um, that lots that even if they were empty for most of the week, there would be a period where they would get used in high volume and the idea of permanent parks taking away those parking spaces became controversial for the surrounding businesses, but only during peak times. So um, I thought that was also an interesting aspect. Um, I got a question from the signing up that said, and I'm gonna throw it to all of you, do you think that a food innovation district would help promote uh, the growing local food scene and business here in Ann Arbor. So if, if, if the city were to approach it from a district perspective that allowed for the proliferation of these kind of businesses. <laughs> well, it depends on whose property it is. You know, you have to have property. You're not supposed to be on the street. So if the city wanted to take away parking spots, they'd have trouble doing that. So district farmers market, somewhat, you know. Right, that would be a good example. Is the farmers, I mean, there's a parking garage two blocks from the farmers market. There's also the farmers market itself gets taken over as, a, as an outdoor market. Could that be a, a venue for food carts? The city property, they'd have to bless it. Get, you have to get along with a lot of people. So it was easy to own a piece of property. That helped a lot. Now, and if I'm not mistaken, one of the specifics, it's not just that you own property, but didn't you also have to have a history of selling food? No. Like, oh, okay, so that's not part of the ordinance. So anyone who had private property could arrange something like this in Ann Arbor? Yeah, if, if, they, if they had a kitchen, and that's what makes it go. You could just park people, I suppose. And let them do their best to find a kitchen in a church or something that wasn't using it. But maybe that's really, a, maybe, maybe that's work. a question we can throw on to um, Kristen. To, to to Mark's point about the it's called a commissary kitchen. It's a kitchen that's sort of a commercial kitchen that is available to smaller businesses that they can share and that in the, it's, it's really, for a lot of different cities, Ann Arbor included, Detroit included, um, at least up to a certain point, uh, it's not that all these mobile vendors have to have a commercial kitchen that they're working out of in order to even operate a truck or a car. And it's, it's again, it's different city to city and truck to truck and yada yada, but historically that's how it's been in Detroit until recently. In Ann Arbor it still is that way. Um, in Eastern Market, to the point about the farmers markets, um, Eastern Market in Detroit is hosting a lot of food truck events. So they do food truck meetups. They also have usually one or two food trucks every time the market's open, whether that's on Tuesdays or Saturdays. And they're also currently in the process of building a commissary kitchen. So I think we're going to see a lot more activity over there um, in regards to these sort of pop-up vendors, mobile vendors, things like that, because there will be a commercial kitchen that they can work out of. Um. Do you have a, Kristen, do you have a perspective on, is the commercial kitchen requirement unique to Michigan? Is it, is it in sync with most states? Okay, I can't necessarily speak to other states, but I can certainly speak to Michigan. There's two types of outdoor food carts or trucks that we license. This is consistent throughout Michigan. 
because we're all under the same food code food law. One is a mobile food cart, and that's kind of what you see at Mark's carts here. They're typically a little bit less sophisticated. They don't have a huge enclosed kitchen with their own water supplies, three compartment sinks. They need that supporting kitchen to do and make a lot of those foods. There are those food trucks that you mentioned. They're basically restaurants on wheels. They have all the bells and whistles, all the refrigeration that they need to make and cook and cool all the foods that they have. So the commissaries are required for the ones that are a little less sophisticated. Most of the hot dog parts you see around town have a commissary kitchen somewhere. Um, we don't have many of the food trucks because typically it's a little bit more challenging for them to find places to set up and operate because it usually is private property or um, they've got to kind of be on the go quite a bit. <laughs> John, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I did. I was curious in, in any of your research or what you found, where's the, which is the more successful model? Where they congregate and there's these pods, or where they're actually mobile and can make their way throughout the community? Where do you see both the better innovation and the greater success for the benefit of the consumer? Like off the grid started with a lot of resistance originally in San Francisco from Parks and Recs, from the city, but now it's a reverse. Like people are actually inviting off the grid to their cities, to their communities to help them. Um, like in Berkeley, the Gourmet Ghetto had, it's this basically not Shattuck area, North Berkeley, where they have all these fine dining restaurants. But there's this meridian in the middle of the uh, road that people like to just sit on and wait while they're waiting to get space to sit in the restaurants. And so the whole area kind of lost its branding and started being called the Gourmet Ghetto. Um, what happened was the Not Shattuck Neighborhood Association invited Off the Grid to come out there um, Thursday nights and change that perception. So now they're sitting there and eating street food and not waiting for seating at high-end restaurants. Um, they did this in Mission Valley uh, around safety, uh, you know, this really abandoned spot under a freeway ramp, um, known for um, suspicious activities, and now it's a thriving kind of neighborhood. Um, people come there, like people now don't uh, associated that space with those kind of activities anymore. So they changed the perception. Um, also, a lot of the main streets in many of the cities are dead. Like restaurants are there, they exist, but the failure rate of restaurants is so high. Um, so off the grid basically comes in and uh, reactivates those main streets so that people now have a memory, you know, oh, now I remember this coffee shop or this restaurant I used to go to, and they actually come and visit more often. Um, so I think the aggregation has created the foot traffic and, and has proven to be a successful model in San Francisco at least. One thing I've noticed here, in I'm, I'm more Detroit based and so I see a lot of what's going on in Detroit, Ferndale, Morello, uh, this group Motor City Street Eats, again, uh, they do, I'm imagining something very similar to Off the Grid where they get these food trucks together and they sort of overtake certain places, whether it's Eastern Market, uh, the Royal Oak Farmer's Market, they do an event their um, first or second Wednesday of, of the month, every month. Uh, but what I'm, what I'm finding, the feedback is from the businesses that are actually hosting it, um, one in particular, I'll get to that in a second, is that basically it, it creates a swarm of people who come in and then they just swoop right back out again. So. You know, there's a flip side to every coin. Um, I think something more permanent, more stationary, like what Mark is doing, is probably going to do more for the community than just a two or three or four hour meetup where people just sort of swarm in en masse and then leave right right, right afterwards. Um, the, the Rust Belt Market had a problem with that when they were hosting them in Ferndale. They were hosting Motor City Street Eats once a month. and. They had all the vendors come in, and all the artists were working, and they all had their booths set up, and all the trucks were there, and people would just basically come and swarm the trucks and create these massive lines, and all these artists were there, and they weren't making any money, and they weren't selling anything, and the Rust Belt actually lost money just for having the electricity on to host this event. So they ended up, they ended up not doing it anymore. Um, so, you know, whether whether there's a, a better alternative, but I think something that's a little more um, stationary that isn't quite so 
event oriented where it's a single event happening once a month that people are going to come to in huge groups and leave again because it only happens a sporadic time, something that's a little more stable, I think would be a better model. Eve, do you have a question? Going back to the requirements that Chris was talking about, what are the different like departments or offices that you need approval from? Like the size of the office department? Like if you were going to do a lift truck to get a spot, like what can you need? Somebody just go through like the basic requirements? Okay, I can't, I, I'm, I'm going to try and answer that question as far as what other permits do you need besides the health department. Um, if you're going to operate in the city of Ann Arbor and you're going to be on public city property, you need a sidewalk use permit. Um, I believe there's a variety of requirements under the city of Ann Arbor and I think that might have been some of the challenges with other food carts and food trucks. I believe the requirements, and again, I'm not, I don't work for the city, so I don't know all the latest and greatest, um, that they don't allow generators because of a noise violation. So that can be challenging because most food trucks need some sort of source of electricity. Especially if you're gonna have food that needs to be held cold, it should be in a refrigerator. Typically the best way to do that is by some sort of source of electricity. So that can be a little bit of a challenge. However, if you're on private property, I don't think that that's an issue. And you can just work with the business owner and work off their electricity. Outside of, outside of the city and the county, I don't know. And then obviously if you're operating in other jurisdictions, Solani, Pittsfield Township, check with, with those jurisdictions as well. Deb? My question is kind of a follow-up. Um, you know, we often hear that our city planning department and all the approvals and all those things, it's not easy to navigate for a new business or an entrepreneur in a bricks and mortar circumstance. How is it navigating that for this? And I mean, sometimes businesses just get really crazed about what's required here. I just, I just figure out who's in charge, and I go to them and I say, what do you need? It's, it's not very hard. So. What do you need? They help you. You're an old hand, though. Well, you just have to wait in there and say, what do you need? And they'll, they'll tell you, they'll tell you, don't call it this, call it that. Nobody knows that law better than Kristen does, or Wendy, sure. Wendy at the city, and so you don't want to, you don't need to figure it out. They'll tell you what you need to know. On the flip side of that, you have the city of Detroit, <laughs> <laughs> which is its own special and unique snowflake. Um, the infamous story of El Guapo, which it, they like to tell themselves as the first official food truck of the city of Detroit. They're not, but. They like to claim that, and for all intents and purposes, they basically are because of the media coverage that they've got and because of the visibility they've given to the whole food truck scene. Um, but they infamously made 60 trips, 60, six zero trips to City Hall to get the proper licensing and permits that they needed because it's the city of Detroit and that's just how long things take. So, so Mark, Mark had a much better experience in Ann Arbor, I would say. <laughs> uh, go ahead. On that food truck, uh, Scene, there aren't really any trucks like that in Ann Arbor right now. Is there a reason for that? Is it not allowed, or is it not feasible, or is it? There might be some associated with the football Saturdays. That's the only time I've seen them in business Saturday, but I haven't seen one that's a permanent. You, you mean one that just is sort of constantly roving? And right, like like El Guapo does. You know, right Once again, that comes down to the city, but I would imagine it has a lot to do no. with. Again, where are they going to park? It, how much money is the city of Ann Arbor going to lose? And that was a big thing when I when I spoke to a representative from the city is that you know they really have to weigh how much money they're going to lose on a parking uh, on, a, on a parking spot to have this truck there, and then you've got the, the businesses it's going to be in front of, and you have to make sure that they're constantly moving. And you know, for the truck, it's not necessarily an advantage to them to be constantly moving because if people don't know where to find you, how are they going to patron you? Um, so that's, that's really been the biggest issue. Ann Arbor's been very welcoming to uh, like the hot dog carts, like the little push cart vendors, but the, uh, the trucks just haven't really taken off here yet. And I, and I know in um, Portland, Oregon, they don't have a lot of roving trucks either, and one of the major reasons are they're worried about sidewalk impediment. Like when you have large masses of people gathering around, if they're in the sidewalk, they're causing problems for whether they're spilling out into the street or whether they're blocking people's right of way. So they actually prefer the stationary cards, I know, over 
the Moot Roman cards for that card for that reason. Uh, what are you finding as the most effective means of marketing the Mark's cards? Because I know a lot of people don't even know they exist. Yeah, well, that makes me feel terrible. <laughs> hey, let's give him the mic. <laughs> How do you get the word out? Yeah. I talk to the press all, anytime. Politicians and press get through every time. So I'm glad to talk to them. And um, uh, some of the clever cards use social media. And I think there are a lot of Ann Arbor.com reporters here having a drink tonight. They've been invited. And so we work it and say hi. And, you don't have like a, beyond that, you don't have like a, a plan for marketing to, to generate more business. They're meeting their business needs. Like, yeah, you can, I, you can only do so much. It really comes down to the food and the service. You've got, you've got to deliver to make people want to come back. I do give a little, when I advertise at the store, I give little piggyback rides to what's going on here and on the food carts too. But um, it doesn't take much to get one chance a lot of people. A lot of people walk by every day, so you've got to make, make sure that chance works for you. How do you generate it for students? I notice it's mostly the students that I found do not know about it. I don't work at students. <laughs> I'm six or eight blocks away, and um, they're always welcome, but I, I don't. Uh, it's a change in population. I don't know how to get to them. I don't, I don't, worry, I don't worry about it too much. They do find us... Uh, those that are interested in locally sourced and organic food sometimes come in the back way through the grapevine and those things. So I have a question um, for the panel. Um, Michigan is not Austin. Austin has a very vibrant food carts, but those food carts can operate 365 days a year. Um, what is kind of the season here and is it a season that can keep growing or is there just a, a natural cutoff where Michiganders are not going to, no matter how many heat lamps you have out, are not going to come and eat at your food cart or drink at your beer garden? In Grand Rapids last winter, I, I saw 15,000 people drinking beer in February out, outdoors. <laughs> So we will do it. They will do it. But uh, that gets into infrastructure. And you're spending a lot of money. Then the, that food cart, the, uh, the food cart courtyard, according to the city, is not much more complex than a backyard garden. It's very simple. It's just got a little running water to it, no sewer system or bathrooms. The beer, beer shed isn't winterized. And it just costs a ton of money to do that. So then you're in the business with all the brick and mortar stores. And I just thought it would be more advantageous to just go with the natural season, which is uh, April through October. For the more uh, mobile trucks, the, the actual food trucks, uh, again, there are these, these meetups that happen once a month in different places, and they're often held indoors. Um, like the Royal Oak Farmer's Market is all enclosed. Um, so that's happening inside. So there's, there is opportunity. and. I mean, I think the, I, if I remember correctly, the first event that they had, that they got something like 4,000 or 5,000, like ridiculous number of people, um, I, I believe that was in the middle of winter. So it's not, yes, there are certain seasonal constraints. Um, the other thing with the trucks that actually are out and about moving around, uh, a lot of times they'll park and they'll be allowed, they'll work something out with a business owner like Mark to park in a privately owned lot where they can stay for an entire afternoon and not have any other further constraints. Um, that's no different for a person who works in an office who's going to go outside and get their lunch from a Subway or from a McDonald's or from wherever. I mean, if they're working in an office building and leaving the building for lunch, if you have a cart that's parked right outside the office building, that's even closer than anything else was going to be, probably closer than your own car. So there are certain seasonal constraints, but I don't think it's nearly as severe as it might seem, at least not for the trucks. For something like Mark's model, it's, it's different. But for something like the trucks themselves, I, I don't think it's as severe as people would assume. Um, Mark, do you have a sense of the, so the carters that you have, how much of this is their career? Or this is, I mean, is it a part-time income? Is it a full-time income, but just seasonally? And then they have to move on to something else. Do you have a sense of that? Most of them do something else in the winter, but I think only one car were dilettantes. Uh, the others are pretty serious and um, worked it. You know, 
know, and as I said before, the ones that worked the most did the best. That's just a lot of hours. Um, any other questions out here? Well, I think I think we've uh, kind of hit the topic as heavily as we can. <laughs> um, I, um, our goal, like I said, was to kind of open up people's perspectives, give you a sense of what's going on locally, what may be going on regionally and even nationally. I want to thank Mark and Nicole and Priya for all coming to speak and kind of share what they know. Um, I want to encourage you all to please have another drink on us. Um, <laughs> um, and um, I want to thank Bill's Beer Garden for letting us do, do this here and there and they're on this amazing day. Um, if you have comments or suggestions for future uh, speaker events, feel free to email me. My email is jeff at concentratemedia.com. Pretty easy to remember. Um, I have to say thank you that we're underwritten by the Michigan State Housing uh, Development Authority. They underwrite our speaker series. And um, hopefully I'll see you at our next month's speaker event. We don't quite know what the topic will be yet, but I'm sure we'll get it out there soon. Thanks so much for coming out.